Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful, creepy human being you. Welcome to today's true crime episode. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing the relatively recently solved cold case. And this was the murder of 24 year old Lori Slizinski. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. Now, before we get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, the sponsor who makes it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do, and that is Dossier. Now, if you're not familiar with Dossier, don't worry. Well, you should be first off because they're a long time sponsor of this channel, but if you're not familiar, don't worry, you're about to get familiar with Dossier. Dossier is a fragrance company that creates luxury scents, but at a fraction of the luxury price point. Where most perfumes can cost anywhere from 50 to hundreds of dollars, which how dare they? Dossier's perfumes are affordably priced at anywhere from $29 to $49, and they have a bunch of different ways that you can save even more, from getting discounts on bulk deals to getting free shipping when you buy three or more bottles, which does sound like a deal that's too good to be true, but I promise you, it is true. So today I have two scents here that I want to tell you about to maybe inspire you see if these might be some scents that you are interested in, or really just to tell you what I'm into right now, because that's what I'm going to do right now. So the first scent I have to tell you about and to smell with you here is citrus matcha. And this is a scent that I picked out because it's totally new for me. And I wanted to go with something that is not my usual, you know, scent profile. So this perfume is inspired by the Lalabo perfume, which is, I believe called the matcha 26. And it has notes of orange, fig, and musk. And I don't usually personally go for musky scents, but after smelling this, I'm like, oh no, maybe I should more often be going for musky scents. Now, the other scent I have here today is Woody Sage. And when I tell you, this one I think is my favorite of the two. This smells totally different than I would have thought, but in like the best way. This one also has notes of fig. Well, not fig, but fig tree, which I don't really know what the difference is there but it also has grapefruit and it has clary sage, which I don't know what clary sage is, C-L-A-R-Y, but it smells, how would I describe this? It smells sparkly. Does that make sense? I don't know. It smells really pretty and I really like it. And you know what else I really like is the fact that Dossier is a cruelty-free fragrance company and most perfume companies, heck, most luxury companies in general are not. And that is like a big thing for me because I only try to buy from cruelty free companies. So if that's something that you prioritize, this could be a good option for you. And also, you know, these perfumes are a fraction of the price of the ones that are, you know, not cruelty free. Anyways, with all that said, of course, I come to you with great news. Dossier is offering members of the Brat Pack the opportunity to get 10% off of their order for a limited time with the code Bratterstein. So you would click the link in my description box, use the code Bratterstein at checkout and get a discount. And you know, I think it's a good deal. I'm not your mom, I can't tell you what to do, but I think you would enjoy it. And if you would like to do that, if you'd like to try it out, peruse the website, maybe pick up what I talked about, maybe see if there's something that's more in line with the scent notes that you enjoy, make sure to click the link in my description box, use the code Bradersan at checkout to get 10% off of your favorite new perfume today. Now, I just want to say a big thank you to Dossier for partnering with me on today's video. It is sponsors like Dossier that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock don't ever change. So now let's go ahead and get into this video. Now this video is on a case that somehow I had never heard of before and it had never been recommended to me. I went back through my list. I searched her name. I searched her murderer's name and neither name came up. And I was very surprised that this isn't one that more people wanted to hear about or discuss because it's absolutely crazy. And I feel like it's the type of case that opens the door, doors, many doors, all the doors to lots of questions. So basically what happened here for the cliffiest notes version of the cliffiest notes, Lori Slazinski went missing in 2006 and right away, police were pretty sure they knew who was responsible because the person they had in mind was somebody who was the last person to see her was reportedly obsessed with her and had a history of murdering two people when he was just 12 years old. Okay. But they did not have enough evidence at that time back in 2006 to convict him. So the case went cold. It stayed cold a while before eventually it heated up again and in a real way. 
So today I'm going to tell you the entire story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I'm going to ask you the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain as we go through the details of this case. But of course, I want you to answer once we have something to go on. But the question of the day is this. I actually have two. One, what do you believe happened to Lori Slazinski the day that she went missing? Like what led up to whatever ended up making it so that she's no longer here with us today? And two, do you believe that the person who ended up being arrested was responsible? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through the details of this case. So with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the disappearance and believed murder of 24 year old Lori Slazinski. Our case today begins on Saturday, June 10th, 2006, and we are in Auburn, Alabama. It's on this day that Lori Slazinski disappeared, and to this day, she has never been seen again, and her body has never been recovered. So it was on this evening that Lori had plans to have, you know, like a girl's night with a friend of hers. It was going to be very much like a, fuck guys, I just want to dance type of night, but also not the type of night at all because they weren't going to be going out. They, Lori was going to be going to her friend Lindsay's house and they were going to be staying in, watching a movie, having drinks, talking, just having a very chill night with just, just the goals, just her and her best friend. So Lori called Lindsay that evening at about 6.30 p.m. And she's like, okay, this is what's going on. I'm about to leave the house. I'm going to run to the store. I'm going to get some stuff for us tonight, drinks, drink mixes, all that jazz. And then I'm going to head to your house. And everything was fine. It was totally cool. It was a totally normal conversation. Then about 30 minutes later, Lori had not shown up, but Lindsay's phone rang and she could see that the call was coming from Lori's phone. So she picks it up. She's like, hello, hello, but she gets no response. And then eventually the line just goes dead. And she thinks like, that's kind of weird. Tries calling her back, doesn't get any answer and doesn't think much of it. But then time marched on. Minutes went by. She didn't show up. Hours went by and Lori didn't show up. And this was unusual. It was not like Lori to like have plans to be somewhere and not show up. And it definitely wasn't like Lori to have plans, not show up and not call with a reason. So at this point, Lindsay's like, okay, I need to figure out what's going on. So she calls Lori on her cell phone. No answer. She calls Lori on her landline. No answer. She calls a friend of Lori's who she knew had been with Lori that evening before, you know, the, they had their phone call, all that jazz, and they had not seen her. Now, instead of worrying, Lindsay tried to rationalize the situation. She's like, okay, something must have come up. She must be doing something else. I guess a friend of theirs, a mutual friend had recently had a baby. So she's like, maybe she went and saw this friend and this cute little baby, or maybe it's something else altogether. But Lindsay went to bed that night, just trying to put the fact that Lori didn't show up out of her mind. But then it was the next day, it was Sunday. And that day, Lori and Lindsay also had plans. They were gonna go to the pool together and again, she doesn't hear from and doesn't see Lori. And she's like, what the heck? This is like very odd. So she calls her again over and over and she's leaving voicemails. She's leaving messages on Lori's answering machine and she's not getting a call back. So she's like, okay, then I don't know like what's going on, but I guess I'm not going to hear from her this weekend. I guess we're not hanging out. And she's like, I'll just see her tomorrow, Monday at work because Lori and Lindsay both worked at the same mental health care facility. But then it's Monday, it's Monday morning and Lori doesn't even show up for work. From there, things moved relatively quickly with people going over to Lori's home to check on her and seeing that something was definitely wrong. Lori's mother filing a missing persons report that wasn't taken seriously enough, as we often see, but it didn't take long for things to be taken seriously because the day after the missing persons report was fired, fired? Mm. Filed, you'll see why I said fired, Lori's car was found engulfed in flames not far from her home. Now, luckily, for those that loved Lori, she was not in her car at the time that it was set on fire, but finding her car in this way definitely took things from a missing person's case to something a bit more serious. But despite all their efforts in investigating the case, it would take 16 years for Lori's family to even get partial resolution. So let's now talk about Lori and then talk about how we got here. Lori Ann Slizinski was the second of two children, her and her older brother, Paul, being born to parents Arlene and Casey. And Lori was born on September 21st, 1981. Lori's family, which was Arlene, the mom, Casey, the father, and Paul, the brother, were actually initially from New York State, but they moved to Alabama when Lori was just 13 years old. And despite being in an age where that could be like a problem from what I've heard, I don't know a lot of 13 year olds, but I've heard that they can be opinionated. Lori did really well with the move. She was happy about all the open space they had because open space meant she could have lots of animals. And she was one of those kids that just like loved animals. 
Lori's mother said that Lori was just like a good person, a kind person, a loving person. She loved sports, loved, you know, walking, riding bikes, movies, video games. She loved her dog, Peanut, because again, she loved animals and Peanut was her little guy and she loved her family. And she was like exactly the type of daughter you'd want, the type you'd be proud of. Her mother said like she was very studious. She did really well in school. She graduated high school and then decided herself to go on to higher education. When Lori left home and enrolled in Auburn University, her parents were like a little nervous to have her leave, but they wanted to make sure she was set up for success. So they bought her a like a mobile home, this little, you know, a home of the mobile variety. Okay. And it was parked in this cute little manicured like trailer park, I guess is what they're called. And it was a place that like a lot of local students that went to Auburn University would live as well. Arlene said she did have a hard time like letting Lori go off to school because that was her baby, right? She had two kids. This was her baby and this was her girl that she was going to be going off to school and living on her own. And she said that when Lori went off to school, she was so nervous and missed her so much that she would call her every day until Lori was finally like, listen, you gotta not do this, mom. You gotta let me live my life. And from there, they didn't talk every day, but they talked pretty often, like every other day and like very consistently. While in school, Lori did really well. She majored in psychology, minored in criminal justice and graduated with honors. And she was so, so over the moon and happy to finally been, be finished with school, though she did have plans to go back to school and get a master's in psychology. But for now, she was just happy to be done and even happier when her and her best friend, Lindsay, got hired at the same mental health facility, the um, East Alabama Mental Health Center, which was Lori's like first real job after, you know, going to school for this was the first job in the field that she had gone to school for. It was really cool for Lori that her and Lindsay could work together because they had become pretty good friends. They'd become pretty close when they met in school. They met during their junior year. And Lindsay said from the moment she met Lori, she knew she wanted to network. She was just warm and friendly and inviting. And there was like a sort of magnetism there. So they were kind of close in school, but really got closer once they graduated and went on to work together. And because they were, you know, close, real buds, spent a lot of time together. It was especially weird when Lori didn't show up for their scheduled girls night. Okay, so you remember how I said they were supposed to hang out Saturday, she didn't show up, they were supposed to hang out Sunday, they, Lori didn't show up, right? And Monday, she didn't show up for work. I can't say for sure why nothing was done Monday, because it seems like at that point, alarm bells would be going off really hard. But for whatever reason, I wasn't there. I can't say why. Nothing was done, or at least nothing was reported to have been done on Monday. Nothing was said to have happened, like the ball wasn't said to start rolling on this missing person situation until Tuesday. So again, Tuesday rolls around. Lori doesn't show up. And this is the second day that she hasn't shown up for work. And it wasn't like she called. She just did a no call, no show two days in a row. And that was strange. So finally, Lindsay goes to the supervisor at this mental health facility and is like, hey, this is what's going on. And I am concerned. And it's at this point that the supervisor is like, okay, how about this? How about you go? You go and you go. Go to Lori's house. Take Thad here. Thaddeus, some guy that worked with them. He's like, you two go and see what's going on. See if Lori's okay. Check out her place. It's about 10 a.m. that Tuesday when Lindsay and Thaddeus pull up to Lori's trailer. They go to the door. They knock on the door. They get no answer. So they try to open the door and they find that it is unlocked. And that's already immediately weird because that's just not something Lori would do. But once the door was opened, that's when Lindsay said she knew something was terribly wrong because her home, Lori's home, was in a condition that she just simply would not have left it. Inside the home, the very first thing that Lindsay noticed was that it was absolutely freezing. Apparently the air conditioner was on and it was like blasting air through that place. And that was something that Lori just wouldn't have done. She was like one of those girls that was easily cold. I feel like we all know that girl that's just cold when it's like 70 degrees. I'm like, can't relate because I'm insulated <laughs> because I'm insulated, right? Um, but it's cold and she wouldn't normally do that because she was the type of person who was often cold. And also because like, she wasn't even home to reap the benefits of said air conditioning. And we all know electricity is not cheap. Okay. But the second thing she notices is that Lori's dog peanut is left in a crate by himself. I actually don't know the gender of this dog peanut, but the name peanut lends in my mind to a little boy dog, but peanut, the dog is in a crate by themselves. Now, the very first thing Lindsay did as an animal lover herself was let Peanut out of the cage because like spread your little wings and fly angel, fly, fly, little Sebastian, right? But 
once Peanut was out of the cage, that's when Lindsay was like, huh, this is kind of weird because Peanut seemed cared for. Despite the fact that Lori was thought to have been missing for days at this point, Peanut's crate was clean. He looked like he had been fed, like he was happy. He wasn't seemingly neglected. And that was weird because that would have meant that somebody was there taking care of him while he was in this crate. And all of this was especially odd because though Peanut was cared for, and that is something that's, you know, good, Lori just wouldn't have left Peanut. She wasn't the type, this dog went everywhere with her, you know what I mean? So she wouldn't have like left this place and left Peanut to be cared for by somebody else keeping him in a crate. That just wasn't something that Lori would do. So all of that is happening over at Lori's trailer. But meanwhile, Lori's mother, Arlene, is at work where she works as a nurse for, I believe, elderly patients, okay? And she gets a call while she's at work from, I believe it was Lori's boss. It was reported as a coworker, but I'm pretty sure it was like her supervisor. And she calls Arlene, or they call Arlene rather. I don't know their gender either. They call Arlene and they tell Arlene like, hey, Lori hasn't been to work in two days. And immediately alarm bells are going off in Arlene's head because she sits there and she thinks to herself, oh, you know what? I haven't actually talked to Lori since Thursday. And she's like, oh, oh shit. Immediately Arlene leaves and she heads towards Auburn so she can check on her daughter. On the way, she calls her husband, Casey, tells him what's going on, tries to call Lori multiple times, but gets no answer. So she calls Auburn police on the way to have an officer be at the, at the trailer to meet her so that she can report her daughter missing. So Lee Hodge was a police officer who worked for the APD, which is the Auburn Police Department. I'll probably go back and forth calling it both of those things throughout this video because I can't stick to one thing, but he worked there from 1980 to 2008, I believe when he ended up retiring and he was working on June 13th, 2006, when the call came in to report, you know, Lori Slazinski missing. After receiving the call, he went to Lori's mobile home, which was located at the um, Ridgewood trailer park where he was met by Lori's friends and family, like her mother, obviously. Now, when he took in the scene, he noticed some things that were setting off alarm bells in his head right away. He noticed that Lori's door looked damaged. It looked like it could have been forced open. It was like a little bit broken and it was splintered. And he also noted that there was a strip plate that should have been at the bottom of the door and that that was gone. And I don't know what a strip plate is, but he did and he noted it. And he noted that all the damage to the door looked to be fresh. Inside the home, he also saw what he believed to be signs of a struggle. The answering machine cord that would have, you know, made it so that Lori could be getting her messages was detached from the wall. So she wouldn't have gotten the messages people were leaving for her. And what was worse is he noticed like scuff marks and what looked like, like, like basically it looked like somebody had been dragged through the hallway and was like kicking and scratching and trying to stop themselves is what it's believed these marks were from going down the hallway towards her bedroom. And there was a single gold hoop with some hair in it, just like on the hallway floor. The officer noted that Lori had at least made it to the store. Cause you remember how she was going to go to the store and get drink mixes and things like that to take to Lindsay's. Well, they were able to tell that she had gone to the store and had even made it home because there were some groceries already in the house and there was, and there was a sign. Basically some of the groceries were in the house and some hadn't even made it into the house. So she got home and was presumably like something happened to her after getting home while she was unloading her groceries, but before even completing the unloading of her groceries. And they were later able to like confirm for sure that she had gone to the store and came back, even though like, why do you need to confirm that when the stuff is in the house? I guess somebody else could have brought it, but they were able to confirm this by surveillance from a Walmart that showed her there shopping, checking out. And after that, she was just gone. Now you remember how I said that there were like scuff marks and scratches in the hallway and the hoop, and it was like leading towards her bedroom. Well, inside the bedroom, the officer noted that Lori's bed wasn't neat. It was very messy and disheveled. There was a phone on the floor and the cord, like the phone cord that would connect it to the wall was missing. In addition to the phone cord being missing, Lori's loved ones told the officer that other items were missing too, like her car, her purse, uh, a couch pillow, a Galileo thermometer, her wallet, a green trash can that she'd normally kept gardening tools in. The can and the tools were normally outside the trailer, like closer to the door, but they were missing. But the lid, however, was found in like one of the storage rooms of Lori's home. Another thing or few things that were missing from Lori's trailer were these three rugs that Lori kept in her kitchen. And these rugs ended up being a big thing later. And they were a big thing to be missing in the first place because Lori kept these on her kitchen floor. And that's because Peanut 
would not walk on tile floor. Like he would only, they, Peanut, would only walk on like soft carpet. So she had these rugs in the kitchen so he could hop from carpet to carpet and never have to touch the linoleum floor, which if you know, you know, this is giving Marbles, Mr. Marble, Bobby, if you nasty, so bad. It's, it's giving Marbles. Now, as we sometimes see in these cases, Lori's disappearance was not taken seriously at first. Like they did file a missing persons report, but the officer was kind of like to Lori's mom, like we got to wait 40, 48 hours before we really do anything. And they're reasoning for thinking that she ran away despite the officer himself saying there was sign of a struggle and missing cords and shit like that. And it seems very much like they should have taken it seriously that moment. They're rationalizing the rationalizing reason. Their reason for rationalizing this was that Auburn was like a college football town and there were a lot of youths all over the place. And oftentimes kids would just like disappear for a short amount of time, but they always came back. Now her family thought this was total shit. They were like, she would never run away. This isn't in her nature. And her friends agreed. They were like, she didn't really have anything going wrong in her life. Like she wasn't like totally happy with her job and she wasn't totally happy with her salary she was making, but that wasn't enough for her to just like bounce and ditch her life and leave her dog and leave her family and friends. But the police thought, you know, maybe, maybe she had. Despite this though, a bolo was issued for Lori and also for her car. And this bolo went out all across the state. At the time of her disappearance, she was 24 years old. She was 5'7", about 160 pounds, blonde or strawberry blonde hair, blue eyes, and she had pierced ears. Now it did not take long for this bolo to be effective because the very next day, so that would be four days after Lori actually disappeared, it was just after 4.30 in the morning when Lori's blue Mazda that she had literally just purchased was found engulfed in flames at the end of DeKalb, DeKalb? D-E-K-A-L-B street in a cul-de-sac that faced towards, oh my goodness, <laughs> Opelika Road outside a construction site. If you're local, please tell us. Did I say those street names correctly? And if not, can you tell us how? Now they were able to tell by looking at this car that it was intentionally set on fire. It wasn't like an issue with the car. Somebody had lit it on fire with a lighter, papers, and gasoline, but Luckily, Lori was not in the car at the time that it was burned, so her family could still hold out some sort of hope that she may be out there okay somewhere. Now, at the scene, they did find some evidence, not a lot, but some. One thing that they found on the first day that they were searching the car in the area near the car was a hand rolled, like a partial, most of, <laughs> a hand rolled cigarette that was wet, but not like soaked. And it was still mostly intact. And this was a good piece of evidence because if you do not know, if you've never smoked or known anybody who smoked, and especially if you haven't known somebody who hand rolls their cigarettes, if you hand roll your cigarettes, you lick the paper, or if you roll the joint, you lick the paper to make it stick like you would with like an envelope or do stamps. Do you do that with stamps? I think stamps just stick. Who uses stamps anymore? I actually just used a bunch of stamps to send out invitations to my baby's second birthday. I don't want to talk about it, but you lick it to stick it. So it has the potential to have DNA on it. So this could have been a good piece of evidence. Now you note, you may notice that I said could, and that is because in this case, the ball was dropped in a real way. This evidence was reportedly mishandled and also not tested. And I don't know who dropped the ball in this situation, but it definitely came into play later at trial. But anyways, that's really the only thing they found during their first search of the area that was noteworthy. They did go back and search again on another day. And it's at this point that they found a gas can that was in the wooded area at the end of the dead end street. And it was at this point that it went from a missing persons case to something more serious. And Lori's mother was terrified, dude. I cannot imagine being her in this situation to have your daughter's car found set on fire. And she said of her fear and her stress at that time, Quote, the feelings were just unbelievable of fear and of knowing something bad has happened. Now, almost immediately, police had somebody that they believed was responsible for Lori's disappearance. And it happened to be the same person that Lori's mother immediately had a bad feeling about and thought may be responsible. And this was a man named Daryl Richard Ennis, who went by Rick. Now, there were a few reasons that people thought that Rick Ennis may be responsible for Lori's disappearance. One of the reasons was that Rick had a big old crush on Lori. 
big, huge. He, he met her through friends. And from the moment he met her, he was smitten and he would tell anyone who would listen how in love he was with her, even people he didn't know that well. And reportedly, his feelings for her were so big that days before she disappeared, Rick had come to her home when she wasn't there, let himself in with a key that he had, and left her a love letter in her trailer. And she wasn't happy about this, okay? Lindsay, her best friend, said that Lori was not happy at the fact that Rick couldn't accept that she didn't want to be more than just friends with him, and she was just kind of irritated that this was something she had to deal with, but she was planning on having a talk with Rick. But you know, that's not the only reason police suspected him because in addition to him loving Lori and not being loved in return by Lori, Rick was also the last person to be with her before she disappeared. So you remember how Lori and Lindsay talked on the phone at 6.30 the day that she disappeared about her like going to the store, picking up drink mixes and then heading over. Well, during that phone call, Lindsay could hear Rick in the background with Lori when she made this call. At the time, she didn't think anything of it because, you know, Lori and Rick were friends. So it wasn't weird that he was there. But then when Lori goes missing, she can't get a hold of her. No one knows where she is. One of the very first people that Lindsay called or contacted was Rick because he had been with her. Maybe he knew something. So she called him. She got no answer. She texted him telling him like, Hey, Lori's missing. No one can get a hold of her. Do you know what's going on? Like, did she say anything to you? And eventually he did write her back and he seemed like mildly worried, but basically said like, no, he didn't know where she was, but he was sure she'd come back. So obviously police wanted to speak with Rick considering, you know, he's the last pe person to see her loved her, blah, blah, blah. So they reach out to him and he agrees to talk to them and he comes and he has to sit down and he has a conversation with them and gives him his version of events. He never denied seeing Lori the day she went missing. He couldn't, right? People knew he had been with her. So he said that he had went to Lori's on Saturday, got there at about three, just to say hi, talk a little while until she had to go to the store. He said that when he went to leave, he realized his car was locked. So he used a wire hanger of hers to open his door, though he didn't mention this right away and added it as a note later. But this hanger was also found by the way, in Lori's home all stretched out. So that seemed to be true. Now, something that Rick said that was weird that definitely caught police's attention is he said that after Lori went to the store, but before going to Lindsay's house, he believed that she was going to go and make a drug deal or she was going to go and sell somebody weed. Rick said that the two of them, him and Lori, were growing weed in her trailer. He said that they had about five pounds, though later he changed this to four pounds. And he said that he was going to keep two and a half pounds and she was going to keep two and a half pounds. Then she was going to go sell hers and then she was going to give him $600, but she was going to keep the rest of the money because he owed her money. He said that he didn't know exactly who she was going to sell it to, but that she would sell hers to anyone. She was not afraid of people, no matter how shady they appeared, referring to her in the past tense, by the way, which officers noted. He said he left Lori and then he went right to Montgomery, Alabama to meet a guy named Rod to sell his weed. But he said Rod didn't have any money. So he went back to Auburn, but not before hiding his weed at a place where he used to live. He says he didn't see Lori the rest of that weekend, that he had spent his time driving back and forth to Montgomery, both on Sunday and on Monday. And finally, I believe it was on Monday, this guy Rod was able to buy this weed and gave him $2,400. But he says he couldn't prove that any of this happened because he had taken that $2,400 and had buried it behind Emily Avenue. Now his alibi was looked into, but this couldn't be confirmed because they couldn't track down this person, Rod at all. He didn't have like a phone number and address. He couldn't track down Rod. And despite taking Rick on location to Emily Ave and digging up the whole area, they didn't find any money. On top of that, Rick had a girlfriend around the time that Lori had gone missing and they had been dating on and off. And I believe at the time that Lori went missing, they were on and off period. So even though they weren't dating anymore, he would still stay on and off with her because they were friends. So he would stay with her sometimes. And sometimes he would stay at a place on Emily Ave Avenue, which is where he had like buried this money. I know this is sort of confusing, but this is his alibi. And police found that this girlfriend that he stayed with some time lived close enough to Lori that he could just walk, walk back and forth from this girlfriend's house to Lori's house. I believe there were train tracks and it was super close to where the car was found burned up as well. Anyways, this ex-girlfriend slash friend slash woman he lived on and off with, she was talked to by police. And she said that the Friday 
that Lori disappeared. Rick had plans to hang out with two friends and then he was going to meet up with her on Saturday. They had plans to get together, but Saturday came and went and she never heard from him. She couldn't get a hold of him. She called him over and over. He never answered the phone and all the calls were going straight to voicemail. And this is the same Saturday that Lori was MIA as well. So all of these things combined are making people's spidey senses tingling and tingling tingly. They're making the spidey senses go crazy and police feel like Rick is sending them on a wild goose chase. And the police officer who spoke to Rick said that they found his statements to be suspicious and conflicting. But here's the thing about Rick, despite the fact that his alibi was looked into and proven to be like, not the truth. He was very set on pushing that narrative. This guy had, Ball, biggest balls in the world on this guy, all the balls in the world on this guy. He called Lori's mom. He called Lori's distraught mother and he told her he was just so worried about Lori because he knew she had gone to do this drug deal and then disappeared. And immediately Arlene was like, I'm gonna call bullshit on that. I don't believe that at all. And she went from trusting him because this had been a friend of Lori's to thinking that he was lying through his teeth. And she knew, she knew that Rick had told police this because police had already come to Lori's trailer. They looked and they found no evidence that she had been involved in selling or distributing drugs, anything like that. So she was like, wow, I can't believe that this guy is lying like this because she knew that Rick and her daughter were friends. She had even had this guy, had Rick in her house um, for Christmas 2005. Lori brought him home with her to have Christmas because you know, he had no family, which we'll find out later why he had no family. But Lori felt bad for him knowing that he wasn't going to be able to do anything for Christmas. So she invited him to her mother's house and Arlene had him in the house and thought he was nice and thought he was polite. And she just knew the two were close. It would be hard to imagine one of your kid's friends being responsible with them disappearing. Like Lori had even, you know how I mentioned Lori had just gotten a new car. Well, when she got a new car, she sold her old car to Rick. So she knew that the two were friends. But now Arlene's like, wow, he's lying and he has to be lying to be taking heat off of himself. Why else would he do that? Because truth is he had some heat on himself. He had some heat on himself. Sure. He had reason to be worried because not only was his alibi not doing well, but when he was brought in to be questioned a second time, police noticed something that they had missed the first time around. And that's that he had some signs of being in a struggle himself on his body. So he was wearing long sleeves like I am today. And he was actually wearing two layers. But despite this, police were like, could you pull up your sleeves a little bit? Like, can we look at your arms? And when he did, they found that he had scratch marks on his arms, his forearms, his like inner arms, his palms, his hands, his knuckles, his arms were all scratched up. And that doesn't look good, right? And when they asked him, like, where did these come from? He said he didn't know, but they could tell that the scratches had been there a couple days and Lori had been missing a couple days. On top of that, they had searched his car and they had found some things that they found to be suspicious. Like, for example, various cleaning products, like a like a scrub brush, which comes up later at trial, um, air fresheners. They also found a knife and fuzzy handcuffs. Now, when asked why he had these items in his car, because they were like, this looks to be a murder kit. This is what they're thinking. He's like, the thing is I'm moving. I'm leaving right now. Actually, I'm going to be dipping very soon after this conversation. And I was just throwing random things in my car. And on top of all of that, on top of all the things that seemed weird, another thing that seemed weird to police is that Rick wasn't as helpful as you would think an innocent friend would be when their friend is missing. Like he was the last person to see Lori, but he didn't tell officers where he thought she was going or what she was wearing. He didn't do that till like a week later. And they were like, listen, if your friend was missing, why wouldn't you just offer this information up to police to make it easier for them to find her? You would think that that's what you would want. And he was like, well, you know, like they didn't ask me. Now, all of that seemed weird for sure. Okay. But when they combined that with one other thing about Rick, it, it really made them think they were, they were on, they were in the, it really made them feel like they were going down the right path because they found in looking into Rick that he had a criminal history and not like a little criminal history, not minor infractions here. Okay. Rick had been arrested when he was just 12 years old for murdering his parents. Well, his mother and his stepfather. And this is a thing that didn't come out to the public until after Rick went to trial, which is something we're going to get to, but it takes quite a while for us to get there. But after his trial, his three step stepsisters, I cannot talk today, stepsisters came out and made a statement where they said, quote, in March, 1993, our lives were forever changed at the hands of Rick Ennis. He brutally murdered our father, Eddie Joe Flowers, 
and stepmother, Linda Dolly Flowers. Ennis was 12 years old at the time of the murders and was put into the juvenile justice system. So now let's talk about what happened there. Linda Flowers, who went by Dolly, this was Rick's mom. She met Eddie Joe Flowers at church, actually. The two met at church and they really hit it off. They were both coming into their little union with kids from prior relationships so they could kind of relate to each other in that way. And things moved pretty quickly with them getting married actually just 10 months before they were killed. So what happened here is in 1993, March of 1993, 12-year-old Rick Ennis murdered his mother, Dolly, who was 40 at the time, by shooting her in the face with a 22 caliber rifle and beating her to death with a baseball bat. He then stayed in the home with his mother's body and waited for his stepfather to come home. This was 39-year-old Eddie Joe Flowers, who was lovingly, he was a musician, he was lovingly given the nickname Elvis due to his sideburns, and he killed him by shooting him with a 16 gauge shotgun. After murdering his mother and stepfather, Rick and Ennis stayed in the house with their bodies, they believe for two days. This kid stayed in the house with the bodies for two days and even continued to go to school and act like things were totally normal before eventually deciding to flee. He then took his mother's car and yet another gun, a 38 caliber pistol, and headed towards Brantley, which was an area that his family had previously lived. But he didn't make it there because he crashed his car into a fence in Montgomery County on March 5th, 1993. And a state trooper named John Clark found him walking down a highway in Alabama and then like pulled over. The officer said he had been driving when his headlights like took a curve. They, there was a curve in the road and his headlights follow said curve as they're at the front of the car. And he saw him scan the boy walking on the side of the road with a backpack. And he's like, that's weird. So he pulled over and he asked him like, what's going on? And this is when Rick told him like, I was driving a car at my young, young age of 12 and I crashed into a fence. And he's like, oh, okay, that's weird. That's a weird thing for you to be saying. And it's a weird thing for you to have been doing. And for whatever reason, it seemed the theme here was weird. He got a weird feeling. So he asked Rick if he could search his backpack that he was wearing. And Rick agreed. So this cop opens the backpack of this 12 year old. And the first thing he finds is a large kitchen knife. He said it was like a big old kitchen knife. And he's like, again, that's weird. And as he looked further in the backpack, he found that there was a bunch of ammo, like loose bullets of 22 caliber and 16 gauge, like the, shot, the, the guns he used to kill his parents. There was ammo from those guns just bouncing around loose in this backpack with this knife. With that, the cop put Rick in the back of the cop car thinking like, okay, something's wrong here. And he's about to get in a bunch of trouble from his parents for taking this car on a joyride. And so he asks him, he looks at this kid and he asks, okay, so where are your parents? And that's when Rick looked him straight in the face and said, quote, I killed them both. And the cop said he had no emotion, no tears, nothing, just straight up was just like, I killed them both. So with that, he finds out where the kid lived, where the parents lived, and he calls local authorities to go and like check out the situation, to go to the house and see if everything was okay, see if this was true, whatever. And what's wild here is that officers who took this call at the time were being followed by a TV show called MPD, which looks to be, I don't think it's on anymore, but it looks to be like a cops show, like cops, but out of Mon Montgomery County specifically. So they're being followed by this this TV show and are being recorded when they walk into this specific scene. I'm telling you, this case is crazy. I'm like, how, how have I not heard of it? How have we not talked about it? It seems absolutely insane to me. When they walked into the house, one of the first things they saw was the broken and bloodied bat that freaking Rick had used when murdering his mother when he freaking shot her and beat her to death. And then they find her and she's lying there with a velvet like blanket over her face and a rose on her chest. He literally took a velvet blanket and put it over her face and put a rose on his chest, which immediately reminded me of the movie, The Lodge. I don't know if you've seen it, but it makes me wonder if this was like a religious thing for Rick, because it seems so fucking weird. But I wonder if it was a religious thing, because in the movie The Lodge, which is similar, it is a religious thing. But either way, this is what all these people are walking into. This is the scene they're finding. Inside the home, they also found the evidence that Rick had been living there after killing them, like I told you they believed he had. And they found Rick's sort of to-do list. And on this list, he had wrote that he wanted to murder his three stepsisters, the sisters of the sisters, the daughters rather, of Eddie Joe Flowers. Now they had given a statement after that that just said that they were very happy to be alive considering Rick planned to kill them as well, but that their whole worlds were rocked and changed because their dad was like their world. And Dolly had been such a sweet woman. Like one of his daughters, her name was Angela. She was 19 at the time 
that her father was killed and she was in the Navy, I believe. And when she got the news that this has happened, this had happened, she was just like, what the hell? Cause like to hear about this happening, then to hear who did it, like she didn't know Rick, especially well, he was, you know, 12 years old at the time, a kid. And she said at the times that they would get together because again, Dolly and Eddie hadn't been together that long, but when she had been around it, Rick was just kind of standoffish. He would go in his room. He wouldn't come out. He wouldn't really engage, but to hear that he had done this to her father and his own mother, and he was only 12 years old was insane. And she said of what she knew about Rick and his family and then and the dynamic there, she said, quote, Eddie Joe tried to explain that he loved Ricky and cared for him, but Ricky pushed him away. He stole guns from my family and made threats, but no one took him seriously. And that's like red flags all over the place. A 12 year old stealing guns and making threats. And speaking of Angela, just because, you know, we are talking about her and that was her statement. She actually went on to get a job in law enforcement due to what happened to her father. And as of 2022, she was working for a sheriff's department in Florida. And there aren't a lot of like statements that were given at the time that Rick killed his parents, like from family members, from friends and things like that. I did find one statement from a stepbrother of his that just said that like all Rick said about what he did is that he loved his mama and he had just lost it. Now, as far as the motive, as far as why Rick would do something like this at such a young age, it's honestly the stuff of nightmares when I read it because it's such a non-motive for end, for for murder of all things, for a hissy fit, perhaps, but murder, it's just insane. Like he said, he killed his mom in such a violent way and his stepdad because they planned to move and he didn't want to switch schools. This is what he told police in 1993. And if that is the real reason, G Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Now, this is what he's saying in 1993, but he does end up changing his story and his reasoning for why he did what he did later in life, because after he is arrested for Lori's murder, he does an interview with 48 Hours. It was Peter Van Sant who looked into this case, talked to friends and family members, and was also the one to interview Rick. And it was interesting because he said that he believes Rick is a genius. He said Rick had a genius level IQ, and that when you talk to him, it's clear that he knows that like he has very much of I'm the smartest person in the room kind of attitude. And he was very obviously the type of person that could convince anyone of almost anything because he spoke with such like confidence and reasoning. Now, during this interview, he was asked, right? Like Rick was asked, why did you murder your parents when you were 12? And this is when he gave a whole new reasoning. He said that he murdered his mother when he was 12 because she had been sexually abusing him. This is what he said. And he said specifically of this quote, I was deeply ashamed about my mother, me, and I had a really hard time talking about it. So that was his reasoning for trying to explain why he did what he did and why he didn't tell police at that time that this was why he did what he did. But it's worth mentioning that there is no evidence that this did happen. It could have happened. Of course, we don't know because she's gone because Rick murdered her. And it has been said that Rick seems like the type of person who would absolutely destroy the reputation of somebody that he had killed, even if they didn't do anything wrong. And I mean, they, they were dead at his hands. So it's like, you, I, I don't know. I don't know what to think there, but I could see how it would be easy to believe that that was true because it's so hard to think of another reason why a 12 year old would do what he did. Like you would think that there'd have to be something to push a child in to committing a murder like that. But I don't know. I don't know. You know, he didn't say anything about it until he was on the hook for another murder. So it's like, it's really hard to believe anything he says. And speaking of the murder and speaking of Lori specifically, Rick Ennis said during this 48 hours interview of the murder of Lori Slizinski, and I quote, I never murdered Lori Slizinski. She was a very close, dear friend of mine. I never would have hurt her. But now let's go back a little bit to when Rick killed his parents. He's 12 years old and he's arrested for murdering them because he didn't want to switch schools. Now, because Rick was 12 years old at the time, he could not be tried as an adult. In Alabama at that time, you had to be 14 or older to be tried as an adult even if the crime was horrific like this. And because of the fact that he was going to be tried as a juvenile, his family knew that he was probably going to get like less than 10 years for what he did. And they were super unhappy about this because I mean, obviously they didn't think it was enough time 
for what he did to these people. And, you know, it could be argued that they were right, because I, I I don't think he served enough time for what he did, even if he was just 12 years old. I can say that because he served less than nine years. He served less than nine years. And during those nine years while in jail, he tried to escape twice and he didn't get any additional time for that. And so he was in juvie until he was 21 years old. And then he was released. He made his way to Auburn. He became friends with Lori Slazinski. And now she is missing Police believe she's dead, and they feel so strongly in their guts that he's responsible, but they just don't have enough to prove it. Everything they have is circumstantial, and they don't feel like it's strong enough to prosecute, especially since they don't even feel like they have enough to prove that the crime has been committed and Lori's been killed. The lead investigator at the time made a statement that I thought was a very good statement and something for us to hear, even if it's frustrating in the situation because it seems so clear that Rick did it. The lead investigator said, quote, we had our suspicions, of course, but if you don't have your evidence, I'm not going to convict someone and you shouldn't. And I mean, sadly, that is true. If you don't have your evidence, which it turns out they kind of did, but they didn't realize all that they had until, you know, cold case investigators got involved in the situation. But if you do have a case and you don't have the evidence, you probably shouldn't convict somebody because that leads to innocent people being convicted for crimes they didn't commit. It, it's, it's a fucking gray area, big time, man. But for years, despite not feeling like they had the evidence for years, they worked on Lori's case. A lot of the investigators seeing her as their own daughter and it helped keep them feeling motivated. But time moved on. Uh, Rick Ennis quickly ended up moving away from Auburn. And when I say quickly, I mean, I think a week after he was interviewed, he dipped never to return again. And Lori's case quickly went cold. And her poor family, man, it was so hard on them to just have no answers for such a long time. And her mom said specifically of this quote, it's very hard on all of us. There are still many tearful days wondering what happened. It's all the unknowns, the questions that remain unanswered that are very difficult for us. We keep thinking she is out there somewhere. Is she being held captive? There are all those unknowns that keep going through our mind. And sadly, in this case, the unknown would be their reality for a long time. 10 years to be exact. It took 10 years for any real movement to happen on Lori's case again. And that's because the Alabama law enforcement agency created a cold case unit and two cold case investigators, special agent Mark Whitaker, who led the unit and his sense then longtime partner, John J.W. Barnes, they were recommended by local authorities, um, Lori's case, and they chose her case to reinvestigate and began pouring over files, re-interviewing witnesses and sending out various pieces of evidence to forensic labs for testing. Apparently Lori's case really hit them, particularly Whitaker, or at least he's the one who's been more vocal about that. Cause he said he saw his, his granddaughters and his nieces when he looked at Lori and he said he would just sit there and watch that surveillance video of her in Walmart, just walking around being totally normal, getting things to have a good night. And then poof, she was gone. And he and his partner really felt motivated to solve this because they really wanted to give that closure to Lori's mother, Arlene. And they said of this quote, She's such a good woman. She's the strongest woman I've ever seen in my life to have been through everything she's been through. Her faith is unbelievable. And just gosh, she's strong. And for a cute mid video fun fact, because it just touched my heart a bit. Apparently, since all of this has happened, Arlene, Lori's mom, is really good friends with Whitaker, the cold case investigator, and his wife. And they're like still buds to this day. And that was just heartwarming for me to read. And I have to think that that's partially due to just like the way and the intensity with which he investigated Lori's case, because he even literally hung a photo of Lori in his closet. So he'd see her every day and be reminded of where his passion was coming from. And he said of this quote, I was probably obsessed with this case, but I think you have to be. So anyways, they felt motivated. They felt competent. They felt excited to take on Lori's case, but they weren't sure that they'd be able to prosecute it without a body because there are some prosecutors who won't even try to take on the case and won't even try to prosecute it without a body. So they went to the DA at that time. His name was Brandon Hughes. And they asked him, they're like, Hey, if we are to do this and we don't have a body, would you be you know, willing to do it? And Brandon was like, yeah, bring me a case and I'll look into it. And like, I am in fact down with that sickness. But Brandon Hughes actually didn't end up being the prosecutor who prosecuted Lori's case. 
apparently he got arrested and was charged with violations of state ethics act and conspiracy to commit theft in November of 2020. And he was convicted. So he wasn't the DA anymore. And a new DA, DA took over and her name was Jessica Ventier, I believe. And luckily Jessica was also down with that sickness. Now, apparently Jessica had like a personal reason to want to prosecute a case, even a cold case that was a murder case. And it's because her grandmother was actually murdered in the 1980s when she was working at a store that she owned. She like owned a grocery store. She was working there and a man came in, shot her, took like all that he wanted, you know, like stole shit from her and then left. And as far as I know, her grandmother's murder was never solved. So she felt like connected to getting this case solved, getting it prosecuted and said that she doesn't think anyone should be able to get away with murder, even if they're really good at hiding a body. And apparently her mother was also super invested in Lori's case. So she wanted to like give them that justice. So the cold case investigators had the go ahead to build the case, make it strong. We'll bring it to trial. So they needed to like have a place to call their own, which it felt very much like something you would see in a movie. They ended up taking this like this used grand jury room and turned it into what they called their war room. You can picture like the boards on the wall with the photos and the lists and all the evidence. All they were missing were like the red strings, you know, because I guess they didn't use computers. They were like old school. They were very into physical media, but it's not called physical media. But I think you know what I mean. They had photos of where the car was burned, like aerial photos of the whole area. They had photos of Lori, photos of witnesses they had spoken to, photos of Rick everything. And they were just constantly combing through all this evidence and putting it together like a puzzle. They were trying to solve the mystery of Pepe Silvia. For 15 months, they lived this case. There were a bunch of investigators. Some people even came out of retirement to come back and specifically work this case. And they combed over everything. There were no days off, no weekends. They re-interviewed old witnesses. They found new witnesses. They found new pieces of evidence and they tested old pieces of evidence that hadn't been tested like the cigarette butt the cigarette butt from the roll, not butt, the hand rolled cigarette that was left at the scene that they had had this entire time, but that had never been tested for DNA. And that wasn't the only DNA found. They had found blood evidence in and on Lori's trailer, as well as DNA evidence found on her bed sheets from a very specific type of DNA that I'm sure you know what it is. And what's really fucked up about this and very frustrating is it turns out they had the results of these DNA tests, the blood and the secretion on the bed sheets for years. Apparently these pieces of evidence had been sent out for testing, but due to a turnover in management, so to speak, where I believe like the lead investigator or somebody got promoted, retired, something like that. The results were put into an envelope, put into the case file and not looked at for 10 years. Everything they had, Everything they looked at led them right back to Rick Ennis as being the person responsible for Lori's murder. Because at this point, they believe that she's dead. It's been all these years. There's never been a phone call, no banking activity, not a, not even, not even a call to Lori's mother and father after her brother died. Cause her brother died after Rick was arrested and she didn't even call them. The cold case team had gotten themselves to a point where they felt like this case was strong enough to prosecute. They knew it was a risk though, right? To prosecute a capital murder case without a body is the rarest of the rare, but they were like, I think our case is strong enough. I think we have all the evidence we're going to have. I don't even think we're going to have a stronger case against Rick Ennis if we find Lori's body. This is what they're thinking. With that, two years later in 2018, they were able to locate and arrest Rick Ennis. And when I tell you it was a production, man, apparently there were like a hundred officers who stormed this guy's home. There were officers from so many different agencies. There are so many different agencies that I'm not even going to try to list them. I'm going to put them on the screen. All these agencies worked together to arrest a now 38 year old Daryl Richard Ennis. And he was arrested in the 4,800 block of Fisher's View Road in rural Pilot, Virginia, and was charged with the murder of Lori Slizinski. And reportedly, he was arrested on his birthday, August 6th, 2018. Now with that, the prosecution was going to have the difficult task of trying to prosecute Rick Ennis for the murder of Lori Slizinski, all without a body. But we're going to discuss all that, all the details, all the evidence they had, the DNA, the statements from people who knew him, 
old roommates and even somebody that Rick reportedly confessed to next week. I know I haven't done a two-parter in a minute, but when I tell you there was just so much to this case and all of the researching, the reading, the writing, the, the watching that I did, there's so much to this that if I wanted to do it and do it right, I feel like it had to be two parts and I haven't done it in so long. I hope you guys are cool with it. And again, you know, I don't do two parters very often, but I don't want to discriminate on the type of cases that I cover, right? Long ones, short ones, they're all a okay with me, buddy. And this one just ended up being like a long one. And I know that last week's was a short one, but I was compelled to cover that one. So now, you know, you get a shorter one and like a really long one. But with that, that my friends is the story of the murder of Lori Slizinski so far. I hope you found it to be informative. I hope my presentation of it made sense. And of course, I just want to thank you for hanging out and remembering Lori with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I want to revisit the question or questions of the day. And that are these one, do you think Rick is responsible? Like what do you think he's responsible? What do you think happened to Lori that day? And do you think it's possible that police got tunnel vision focused on Rick and he wasn't actually involved? That's kind of going to give you a little sneak peek as to where next week is going to take us. But let me know all your thoughts in the comments below, because I'm curious as to where you stand right now without hearing all the trial information. Anyways, guys, before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a comment down below with any cases you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you may know, I have a long list of cases. Whenever you leave me a suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because they're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with great ideas and great taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out new videos every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below, along with a link to my membership and a link to my merch store. I'd like to say one last thank you to Dossier for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Dossier that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.